So, what am I going to talk about? Um, <coughs> uh, I'm going to move into uh, local oscillators and what they're about, and um, uh, see where we go from there. Uh, <coughs> Ever since really the inception of um, satellite LMBs, um, the local oscillators have always been what we know as DROs or dielectric resonator oscillators. And <coughs> they are generated generally by a single transistor oscillator with the frequency set by a DRO puck. And the the reason they're called a DRO puck is because they look like an ice hockey puck. <laughs> and I've got one, got a couple in there. They're quite small as you can see. These are 10 gig ones. And in Europe, and I stress this, the typical frequencies that you'll find in the LMBs and 9.75 gigahertz or 9.750 megahertz and 10.6 gigahertz. Uh, in the USA they use slightly different frequencies. The more common LO in the US is 11.25 so they're a bit higher. And as I say they're tuned with a uh, it's a sort of type of ceramic uh, disc and they're tuned with a tuning screw and is the sort of top off one with a screw in here and protrudes through the back. It's very crude stuff, all designed to a price, of course. Uh, <coughs> so, if we look at uh, what happens in an LMB at the uh, DRO, um <coughs> the dielectric puck is here. And this bit here is the uh, oscillator transistor. <coughs> and this uh, horseshoe, or tuning fork, whatever you want to call it, is the, uh, is the resonance structure that's coupling in and out. <coughs> Everything else is, uh, this bit's bias. And uh, coming out of here, I don't know, I can't remember if that's a uh, resistor or a capacitor, it could be either because uh, that's coupling off into the mixer. And that's basically how they, uh, how they work. And this is the, <coughs> moving back a bit into the LMB, is what it looks like. Um, <coughs> in fact, it, there's a picture inside one of these LMBs. I'll explain a bit about that in a minute. Um, I sort of take you through this thing. Obviously, that's the bit we've just been looking at. There's the, uh, the DRO, and uh, these two are of interest because they're both the front end. Uh, I'll explain this word up here, legacy. And the reason they're called legacy LMBs because um, these are the signalling system for them is the original, goes back many years, uh, tone and volt signalling. And um, and so they tend to have that name. You'll see in a minute. There's a, another description will come up. Just moving through here quickly. Um, these LMBs. Uh, if you were to look down the waveguide, there's actually sort of two probes in there. Uh, one for each polarization, because you have both uh, horizontal and vertical polarization. And if you went back to the very very original LMBs, a lot of them had. Um, uh, had uh, ferrite polarizers, and you pass some current through, and that shifted the polarization. These days, silicon's much cheaper, and so as I said, everything's built to a price. And so, what you have is two FETs, two front end FETs one there, one there, one's horizontal, and one's vertical, and you turn them on and off basically to select. In fact, it's so crude the drains of the two FETs are actually connected together <laughs> on this design, they're not always, but it's sort of cheaper. Uh, this device here is the second stage amplifier, so it's common to everything. And um, another thing to point out probably here is there's a, there's a filter, 
<coughs> that covers the whole of the uh, t um, satellite TV band. And then here's the mixer with the DRO, a bit of matching and filtering, and there's a six pin uh, surface mount device, that's the IF amplifier, which will have quite a lot of gain. And we're going from end to end, going from one of these, the probe points are out here actually, that's where the probes are into the waveguide, um, to the F connector here is uh, typically about 50 to 60 dB, so loads of gain. Always bear that in mind if you use these things. Um, there's a component missing off this one. This one's been a bit hacked about. Forget what I did with it now, but probably got chucked in the bin. Um, there's a, a diode missing up here. It's called a TVS diode, transient voltage suppressor, lightning strike suppressor. Okay. <coughs> So what's new? Um, <coughs> I'm a little bit out of sync on this presentation because I think we've loaded up the wrong one. <laughs> I've got two on here and the other one was the one I gave in July and I've got a feeling that's what we're seeing so you'll have to bear with me a bit. Um, basically what happened was about two or three years ago and it is fairly much as re recently as that, um, <coughs> a couple of things started to happen. These DRO pucks contain rare earth materials and the major supplier of them, um, or country of supply really, is China. They come from China, the materials come from China. And the Chinese government decided that they didn't want to let too much more of this material out. So they started embargoing it and this gave a bit of a problem for companies like Murata, who are one of the major manufacturers, um, who are Japanese, who um, suddenly found their supplies of rare earth material uh, dwindling. So they put a lot of research into uh, generating slightly different materials. And we've spent about three years, of a company I work for anyway, evaluating new ceramic pups some of which worked okay and some which didn't. So that was a bit of a problem. There was a solution on the horizon but it was a bit of a slow one. About the same sort of time the chip manufacturers decided that they would design some new devices. And they've come up with a thing that's got a single device and you'll see a picture of one in a minute that contains a mixer, that's a microwave mixer at uh, 10 or 11 gigs, with an onboard LO, and it's, uh, it's not a DRO anymore, it's internal to the chip, and the IF amplifier, plus a whole load of, con of control circuitry in it. There's a heck of a lot of stuff in one of these things. Um, and these things are starting to come onto the market, and that's what uh, you'll be hearing a bit about this weekend because I know Kevin's going to be talking about it. He's got one here. I, I've got a couple sitting on the chair here. Um, <coughs> and uh, these, the LOs in these things are phase locked. As you'll see there's a, a crystal on there. And uh, uh, that makes them quite interesting because we can use them for other things. And we've been playing with them for narrow band. 10 gig operation. Uh, in fact, uh, it's uh, of some interest. The only thing I will say is I have made, as part of my work, uh, quite a few um, phase noise measurements on them. They're not brilliant. <laughs> I think that's the polite way of putting it. <laughs> um, but they're adequate for satellite television use. So if you've got a wideband signal, it's too much of a problem bit more of a problem if you want to use them for narrow band and uh, probably want to use them for contesting. <laughs> and, and so I've got some pictures of the inside and you'll probably notice some similarities with the older type of LMB design. The key difference of course is you can see straight away the crystal on board, in this case clearly marked 27 megahertz. 
<laughs> yes, Graham. <laughs> uh, and um, and that's feeding into this chip here. More of that as we go on, because that is one of these magic chips. It's a 24-pin surface mount device. The other bits are pretty standard. This, these devices, let's just wave a couple at you. So as you've seen them, they don't look a lot different, do they? <laughs> these are single LMBs. Got their cover um, horn covers on. So nothing too different. The, <coughs> the manufacturer of these, uh, the reason I've gotten these are the scrap ones we were evaluating. They, they both actually work, so that's quite good. Um, they're designed by, Ch or, yeah, designed and manufactured by a Chinese company down in Shenzhen near uh, Hong Kong, and um, uh, they are. I think the word is cheap as chips. <laughs> they are very cheap, all things considered. The front end um, looks pretty similar. You've still got the same idea. We've got two front end devices connected to a, each one connected to a probe in the waveguide, so that's very, very standard now. Uh, the subtly, they haven't connected the two drains together. They're actually blocked and they've got separate feed biases. If you follow those, there's another slide. Next slide actually is a little bit clearer. And the uh, the gate bias is fed in as well. That's that one going in there. And if you count up, there's four tracks there. And those four tracks go into here. So that's the uh, drain and gate bolts control all coming out of this wonderful chip. <laughs> um, there's nothing else, just a load of R's and C's. That's where the F-type's connected, regulator up there. Uh, yeah, there's no lightning protection. It's a Chinese LMB. They never have it. Don't have lightning in China. <laughs> Much. <coughs> Except when I'm there in August. It's always, it's always thunderstorms. Um, and here's a slightly better view, perhaps, of, uh, of the front-end area. You can see what I was talking about. That's a probe. That's a probe. Front-end device. Drain. Drain. Uh, drain bias, gate bias. Second stage amplifier, same again. As I say, no, no microwave filter in there at all, so they're pretty wide open. I think they rely on the waveguide on the front, that's about the only filter there is. Which of course, as you all know, is a high pass filter. If you didn't, you do now. Um, and so on. So. That's the synthesized LMB. That's what Kevin's been playing with. Absolutely. Yeah? yeah. So I'm I'm intrigued. Is it possible to get an architectural view of what's going up in that chip, or even a data sheet, or is it still under NDA? I think you must have been asked that so many times. It's Chinese. Now on the RDA website, I'll, I'll put the name up in a minute. And if, if you think they're going to give you any information at all, you've yeah. got to be kidding. They are Chinese, they're based in Shanghai which is actually where our factory is. Um, and um, getting information like that out of a Chinese manufacturer is blood out of stone. <laughs> Best of luck. Um, they'll probably tell you what's, what the connections do, and that's about as far as it goes. The rest of it, you'll have to adopt the method they use, which is um, you know electro electron microscope photos of the comp competition so they can copy it. Oh, is it my mouth? <laughs> um, there we go. <coughs> In the industry, we, we, we dub it the do-it-all chip, you know, because it does everything, doesn't it? You know. There's actually a microwave front end, a microwave mixer in, you know. Um, got the yellow, does everything. No filtering, <laughs> of course. So it's, multi it's multiple functions in a 24-pin surface mount package. The manufacturers of these are the ones that in these LMBs are made by a company called RDA. They are Chinese. Um, NXP, who uh, are what you might have known as Philips Semiconductors. Um, that's their current name. They also make a similar chip. And they are the chips that the company I used to work for we'll be using is the NXP ones. The reason for that is 
we've already said is getting information out of China is difficult and secondly the RDA chips uh, I've probably measured about 50 or 60 of these and the failure rate was bigger than you like you know uh, and these chips do have you know, been having a habit of failing uh, the other manufacturer is Entropic they're American um, I think it's possible Skyworks and RFMD, RF Micro Devices, probably do them as well. And there's just another picture, a slightly bigger um, blow up of the chip where it says RDA on it. Um, and that's about as much information as you get, other than what's on the data sheet, which is not a lot. Right. Okay, <coughs> um, I think what I'm going to do at this point is break the presentation, just see if I can find what should be the correct one. amazed that I've lost it if that's the case but perhaps it has gone it's still on my PC so <laughs> right okay <coughs> where's the slideshow gone No. Oh, oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I found it. Uh, right at the top. Oh, that's much easier, isn't it? Got it. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I've lost the, the bits of the presentation that I've added in, which is a bit unfortunate. So I've got some quite nice plots. And I'll have to show those that are interested later on uh, <coughs> of what <laughs> happens in the IF range of these. Um, of these chips um, <coughs> because one of the things we're interested in is what can you do with them and, um, and to do that you have to know what frequency response you're going to get out of the IF especially if you want to put it into uh, some sort of receiver um, and of course generally what we're dealing with satellite receivers which cover 950 megahertz to 2150 or at least that's the satellite band um, <coughs> uh, many of the receivers on the market today will cover quite a bit bigger frequency range I don't know if anybody's actually measured any of these um, I've not bothered but I've certainly got the capability of doing it but in general they'll go down much lower in fact um, nobody here from Sky TV is there otherwise I'm going to let a cat out of the bag a bit um, Sky are investigating a set-top box that works down to 200 megs because um, they asked us to do some LMBs where the IF went down much lower and we know it's 200 megs <laughs> so uh, um, they're trying to use a bit more bandwidth and it's channel stacking they want to put m many more channels so as you've got so many more hundred channels of uh, rubbish TV to watch <laughs> Cable tuners did that anyway, didn't they? Yeah, a lot of the cable tuners do, yeah. But they're, so they're trying to get everything in one box, I think. Um, so uh, <coughs> if we look at uh, how you control LMBs, all, all of these um, types of LMB, these sort of simple things, are, are controlled using tone and volt signaling. Um, the polarization was always controlled. Uh, with voltage, so typically 13, less than 13 volts is vertical polarization. Uh, greater than 13 volts, up to about 18, is horizontal polarization. I think that was compatible with the old fer ferrite polarizers. These days, it's just decoded simply for the voltage uh, threshold. Um, and then the local oscillators. If you've got two LOs in the LMB. Um, <coughs> which this, this one ha actually hasn't, it's only got a single LO, but uh, many of them have two, including the um, 
or synthesized ones, which I guess have been passed around. But um, what you do with those is uh, fortuitously, if you want low band, which happens to be the more convenient that we want to use, um, you just put volts on it. <laughs> um, if you actually want to select the 10.6 gig um, LO, you apply a 22 kilohertz tone continuously onto the voltage line. And you, so you stick that all, all in. Um, normally that would come out of the set-top box. That's one way of doing it. <coughs> and that's certainly what's been done on all simple LMBs. Like that. That's uh, that one. Um, but a lot of the more modern LMBs use a different method, which is known as a signalling system, which is defined in a Senelec protocol, it's known as DISEC, uh, which stands for Digital Satellite Equipment Control. Bit of a mouthful, but uh, <laughs> that's what it stands for. If you see the letters DISEC, they look a bit funny because of the way the acronym's been put together. And I still use 22, uh, 22 kilohertz, but it's now bursts of it. Um, little bur data bursts coming out of it, and they're encoded with address and data codes. Uh, a typical one for a satellite LMB would start something like E2 hex, and then an address which might be 10 or 11, fairly common ones, uh, and then some more data, depending on what, what you're trying to do, depends how much more data you get. So that's, uh, that's how you control these. Uh, a typical HD set dot box would have it built in internally in the micro, whether you used it or not, depends on the LMB. And of course all that's superimposed on the F connector on the IF. <coughs> okay. <coughs> um, so if we have a look at what, what we'd use these LMBs for, for um, 10 gig, in this case 10 gig narrow band and amateur television. So <coughs> as we've already seen, mo most of the IF filtering is fairly minimal and many of them will still give high gain down to 200 megs. Uh, the company I used to work for, <coughs> most of ours would not. They had IF filtering in them as well as the RF filters, goes without saying. Um, <coughs> so that could be a little bit of a problem. Some of, some of them did work down. I, I have got some here that, that do a little bit better. So you, you kind of want to know when you buy one of these things, because there's an awful lot of them on eBay. That's where most of us are Absolutely. picking them up. Yeah. They're quite cheap. Um, and the common ones are being offered on eBay by a German distributor um, called Octagon. They're the most common ones. And I think that's what's probably appearing on all the forums, is that right? right. Yeah. The Octagon ones. Well, Octagon is just a trade name um, for a German satellite distributor, basically. Uh, that's all it is. All of the LMBs they're distributing are made in China. Oddly enough, they're all made in Shenzhen out of the same factory. Um, they do have quite a good sort of plastics industry goes on around there, so you can have any colour and any shape you like, <laughs> but what's inside is pretty much the same. There's obviously variations on the theme, different things going on, but uh, that's fundamentally what's happening. And they are quite cheap, because they turn them out, I would estimate they're probably turning out about 100,000 a month. Uh, this factory, from what I saw. So get your head around that. <laughs> In a year, that's more than a million. It is pretty scary, yeah. So what do we use them for? Well, with the LO set for 9750, which is probably optimum for most of what we want to use it for. Um, I'll make no apologies. I've done the narrow band bit first because it's a little bit easier to get out of the way, and then I'll move on to TV usage usage. Um, 
the narrow band segment of 10 gigs that we use is 10368 to 10370, so just 2 megs worth of it. That translates to an IF of six, 618 <coughs> to 620, 618 to 620. So it's a little bit on the sort of awkward side because it could be outside the range of many satellite receivers, but not all. Uh, for narrow bands, less of a problem because we can down convert it, which is what Kevin's doing probably. Um, <coughs> most of the activity, anyway, is between 050 at the bottom and the beacon bit, which goes up to about 10369 roughly. And the top beacon's about 995. Um, <coughs> so that's the narrow band bit. Oh, no, I've got my plots. That's good. So this is obviously is the right presentation after all. Jolly good. Um, and this is just showing uh, a plot of on, on my spectrum analyzer of the IF bandwidth that you could get from two different LMBs. Um, the green one is one uh, the noise floor is down here, by the way, and that's set because there's a 3 meg bandwidth on the analyzer. I'm trying to look at quite a big chunk of bandwidth here. Um, so 200 megs to 1.5 gigs. And on most spectrum analyzers, you can't get the noise floor down low enough. Um, but it, it's quite a good way, and we use it professionally, to find out if an LMB is working. It's a very quick test. And in fact, uh, for the rest of the day, I've got my measuring set up here, which I hope Kevin will be able to help me to set up somewhere. Just set that up for you on that analyzer. OK, that's yeah, fine. Well, you can see the same, plot, same sort of idea. Yeah. Well, you can get a plot of the eye if you can see straight away if it's going to be any good or not. That's the thing. That's what you want to know. Is it going to work? If it rolls off like this one, probably not. <laughs> um, on the other hand, this yellow one here is one of the ones you're passing around. It's the... Um, the synthesized LMB, and it's quite a gentle sort of slope down to the noise floor. And you'll all be confused, as I was, about what's this funny spike doing here. And I was, when I was measuring this in my shack on the analyzer and capturing the plot, I did scratch my head and wonder what it was. And I thought, oh, it must be a spur in one of these Chinese LMBs. <laughs> uh, you find plenty of them, usually. Um, and then the penny dropped, <laughs> because I, I had the marker and I measured what the frequency was. And uh, it's this one here, four, roughly 474 megs. Anybody got a f mobile phone with a calculator on? If you add 9750 and 474, you get 10224. And I realized I was holding this thing pointing out of the window. <laughs> and my 10 gig narrowband is masthead mounted. So that's my LO radiating gently, <laughs> about 20 feet away. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll leave it in the slide for interest. <laughs> I've got another plot where I turned it the other way, and you can't see it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's a fairly good demonstration, actually. Uh, it tells you straight away this yellow plot is, is going to be OK to be used using over quite a decent bandwidth. So. so quite useful if you can do that or know somebody that can do that kind of measurement. You'd probably do it on a, you know, a scanning receiver or something, just listen for the noise to go up, because the noise level will go up hell of a lot with 50 or 60 dB again. I mean, there's only a 10 dB to my noise floor here, but even so, it's still quite significant. So if you want to use them for ATV, what can you do? Same thing, really. 9750 is really the best LO. I did some sums on the 106. It's really not worth using. <coughs> Added to which, you've got the complication of having to feed it with 22 kilohertz all the time to keep it there. Because if you remove it, it'll drop back. So, if we look at the 10 gig band, now I've started at 10250, and Murray's probably not here at the moment. But 10250, I'm taking a slightly conservative view that we could lose the bottom bit of 10 gigs. We really lost a chunk in there. Yeah, sorry, no, but you know, <laughs> being pragmatic. <laughs> um, so 10, 250 ups, probably safe, I hope. Um, to 10, 3, 6, 8, bottom of the narrowband section, that gives you an IF of 500 megs to 618. 
118 megs worth of bandwidth, which is quite a bit. That's quite about, what's that, about 7, 16 meg channels. So you can get a bit of TV in that. Um, and then the top bit, 10370 to 10450, so you've got another 80 megs there, which corresponds to uh, 620 to 700 megs. So a bit of bandwidth to use there. So that, you know, kind of fits with these LMBs quite well. Uh, and there's the bandwidth plot. Oh, I have put some markers on it. Um, down that 6618, this bottom marker. And there's one there which gives you the nominal gain point. Um, <coughs> so the difference, I'll read it off for you, is only about 3 dB, just, just a fraction over, about 3.3 .3 dB between 618 and um, uh, sort of a 950 meg in-band signal. So you don't lose too much, that's the thing. So you don't want one that rolls off too quick, that's fundamentally it. And as I can produce those plots, if anybody's got any LMBs here, I can measure them. Okay, <coughs> there are some trends going forward, um, and this is one that's been around now for a year or two. I don't know if you might have seen these. It's started off being a quite a big interest in the USA. I'll explain why that is. And it's called the SCR LMB. SCR stands for Single Cable Receiver. It's not very clever. Well, that's because it's American. <coughs> and the idea being that these LMBs only have a single output. So they're called single LMBs. But you can buy duals, which have two outputs, quads, which have four, and octos that have eight. <coughs> and if you had an Octo LMB, you've got eight cables coming away, which you've got to get into your house. The idea being you can feed it out into every room's TV satellite receiver. In the American household, that's not unusual. Um, <coughs> so it's not very practical. Uh, so what they've decided is that it would be much nicer if we could get all these signals down one cable and then do things with them. So effectively what they do is they multiplex them all onto a single cable. So they have a single cable for all the outputs regardless whether you, I don't know whether they're going to bother with twin, um, although it does make it cheaper, but quads and octos. And it's um, at the moment it's being done with uh, a chip that's got several onboard mixers and synthesizers. These synthesizers are at L-band at IF. Um, so they basically what they do is they take the, all the satellite outputs and they, you choose your channel and then you tell it where you want it to come out. So it'll start off on channel 36 but come out on channel 50, just making up numbers in my head. But you see the idea, you can direct it. And what you do is you allocate a set-top box in a room as having that set of channels and that's, that's how it's done. Is demultiplexer. Um, these chips, I mean, were the ones we've been looking at are made by Entropic in the States, and uh, they're not, not too expensive, but they're a bit more than we would like. Um, so we think there's probably a trend sort of doing something different with that. I think you do pay a penalty in uh, size because, you know, looking at a single LMB, which is the one on the left, and he, here's its equivalent. And so it does, you know, this <laughs> adds a bit of real estate. But on the other hand, it does save having lots of cables coming out. Um, these have got four outputs. They're actually quad output. Because it's the number of um, mixers and synthesizers in the chip, basically. Put two chips in. Uh, I think they're dual chips. So there's two chips in that one. Uh, you could have six or eight. Yeah, mm, yeah. They actually have quite a lot of gain, Peter, in the chip. Oh, yeah, so you, so you, yeah, you don't lose too much. The on the cable, yeah, you can afford the losses on the cable because they drive the cable yeah, like mega hard. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Jury's out. <laughs> um, 
what, uh, what you see when you look in the bottom is um, here's your SCR output and they also have labelled this one standard because it's a legacy output, it's just a normal you know, full band out and it gives you that as well. Uh, actually you need that to find out if it's working when the uh, SCR chip fails. Mm. Uh, that happens. Okay, so looking ahead a bit, what's happening in the future. Um, at the moment, the problem with SCR is a bit expensive. Multiple LOs are, you know, expensive and space inefficient and so on. What we think, all my ex-colleagues, all to a man, reckon they're not, uh, we're going to move on. We're going to see some even better um, DS, DSP type chips. And what they will do, take a big lump of bandwidth, about 500 megs worth, and digitise it and do it that way. Well, that's what we think will happen. Well, we're fairly sure because you talk to manufacturers when you're in this business, you know. <laughs> so, uh, not surprising really. <coughs> so, we, ge we generate the user bands digitally, that's what they're known as. Unfortunately, they're not a lot of use to the amateur community, but of course, the thing is, if we do it, if they do do it that way, it might be an opportunity for somebody to sort of blag some code and mess about with it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so so there might be something we could do. Um, but these do-it-all chips, these mixer LO IF chips, I think we're going to see those uh, around for some time. The price will come down and there'll be quite... Um, I think we'll see the... We, we think in the industry, or we thought, that it will be the death knell of the DRO. We will actually see them disappear because... There's just so many advantages um, going down this route. Um, it's a lot neater. And if I were to tell you that this LMB, they're the same one, one with plastics, one without. We manufactured these in our factory in China. These are just ordinary legacy LMBs. But the build and test cost, the whole thing to us, was two and a half to three dollars, US dollars because th these were made for um, Brazil, uh, yeah, Brazil. So South American market, basically. Um, and, the, the, yeah, and obviously they want to get the price of these octagon-type LMBs, the synthesized ones, down. They're a bit more than that. The build cost is probably about 7 or $8. It's all quite critical in this area, you know, because a lot of people making a profit. Uh, the test time's the same. Is it? Mm, it's sort of 30 seconds. If it's more than that, it costs too much. Right. The only problem is that if they fail, the size of the bin has to be very big. <laughs> so that is a problem. But um, no, we don't. There's no test time is very carefully controlled. Has to be, and I had a lot to do with that. So. Okay, any questions? Yeah, so this is an old, I didn't save the very latest. Like it isn't time for lights. No, Don't I, give them the wrong idea. I took that out, you see, I knew it was slightly wrong. I obviously didn't, I thought I'd save the final version. It's actually not that different. But any, any quick questions? Any quick mind? questions? Now, um, now, so. Yeah, apologies for that. Um, the, the, the drive level of the 27 megs into the chip. Sorry. Uh, sorry, no. The, the actual drive level into the chip, I mean, I've just been driving them at um, about neg 20 dBm. Right. Um, is, is that documented anywhere? Because, you know, the spurious does go up, as you'd expect. Uh, it does, and the answer is no. Um, well, um, NXP, I think, do. I don't have a die cheat in my head, but if you looked at the NXP one, they do specify it. They the Chinese ones definitely don't because if I was to ask a Chinese guy what it was he'd scratch his head look at me and say why do you want to know because yeah. he just put a crystal on it <laughs> yeah any more questions okay indeed they are yeah yeah, no, I, I agree they are. I, I play with mine, so I know they are, yeah. 
Okay, I think we'll uh, call it a day. Brian, you're going to be around the rest of the day. I will be around. He's got his day. test set up, so if anybody did happen to bring an LMB with him, he's more than happy to test it. Um, I think uh, big thanks to Brian in a normal way. <laughs>